Perfect. So, so you were saying, I'm sorry, your, your job description? Well, it's like in my job description, I, for like two years, I was just writing, 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 writing. <laughs> and now all of a sudden, I'm just, it's just interviews, interviews, interview. it's just a completely different, it's like I have a new job and right. it's not, you know, and it's not my thing. And so it's weird. <laughs> But I think I think uh, what I like about the the format that I've looked at, the, the most of the people you've spoken to are friendlies, and also yeah. um, you are basically articulating the book in spoken form. Um, you know, reading is is one piece, and there's a subset of people that do, but a large part of our audience don't read that much. Some some are, are yes. heavy readers, but they love the sound bites, they love the voice, and you know, uh, when I look at this is not as much a book promotion. That's the back end. I don't chase the money. If you provide excellence, the money follows. Um, this is going to be a nerd out session that is going to be so valuable, I hope, for our audience in the space that both you and I occupy. You with the, with the degrees behind your name, me without them. Um, but I think that if it resonates with our population, um, there's going to be more traction for buying the book than just because we say it's a good book to buy. D does that make sense? And oh, for sure. And and I don't, I don't view podcasts as promotion for the most part. I mean, I'm, it's all the, um, there are all these other things I have to do that, that are, that are uncomfortable, but um, yeah, no, I, I actually love the podcast interviews because we get to, like you said, kind of nerd out and we can go, everybody asks different questions. And you get to think about different things together from a different angles. And I actually that I don't mind at all. <laughs> okay, so it's the it's the more formal. Have you done a lot of TV work and that kind of thing? I've started to do more TV and radio and things like that, which is is just stressful. <laughs> but like you know what, the fact that you're able to do that is a huge big feather in your cap. That that you most folks are not able to get to that platform. So as much as it's a burden, uh, most people desire that and can't get there. If that if that makes sense. Oh, I guess. I mean, I I um. I, I have been I have been really fortunate to have help with that. So you know I've been gifted a certain amount of help for a certain period of time, and I'm trying to just make the most of that while I have it. Because this is yeah. such an important narrative, and uh, it, it is not something that's spoken about enough. Um, Chris Palmer's done a good job on the more psychiatric part. Um, you're looking at the brain met, uh, metabolic pathway. Um, but but I think it's such an important concept to be putting out there because we seem to be trapped in diabetes and obesity too much. And the other uh, manifestations of metabolic syndrome, of metabolic illness, especially above the eyebrows, is such an important and such a poorly understood uh, <laughs> piece of work. And, uh, you know, it's a space that I work in to a certain extent. And I'm going to use some of my foundation to question you with your professional accolades. So, uh, but I, I, I'm thrilled to be, I, you don't, you have no idea how much respect I have for you, uh, not as a physician, but as a human being. You've really impacted me, the little bit of correspondence and things. The I'm going to talk about that a little bit, so I'll keep that for the, but it, it, you have no idea how much impact, positive impact um, you've had on me as a human being. It's it's really been, and I want to give you that feedback because it's it, it, it it's one of the few heroes that I truly have. Rob, well, that's, that's... <laughs> Wow, I mean that, that's really nice. Thank you. Um, sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm I'm doing the same, but it 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 comes from my heart, and and you know that's the that's the important part because you've got Harvard, you've got a bunch of degrees and pieces of paper, but they don't represent your humanness and the way you connect people and the way you connect with people, and your humility, and and that is so empowering and so powerful. Um, and it, it it makes a big difference to me personally. So I appreciate you in that regard. Wow, thank you. And I appreciate you. I mean, I've learned more about food addiction from you than I think really anybody else. And, um, you know, just the some of the ways you think about things is just, just, just kind of rewired my brain around certain concepts, you know? Um, and, you know, if I've, if, if, if the human element is coming across it all. You can just thank my mom, my 90 year old mom who lives next door. I'll go tell her afterwards. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's what we can aspire to is living that long with a healthy brain. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking about. So, um, you know, I, I, I've already recording, so, so we can jump in here. I'm going to uh, just do one little thing here um, from an introduction perspective. Um, let's go ahead and do this. You know, folks, 
Uh, this is Dr. Rob Sivas. I am the Carb Addiction Doc, and I am thrilled. Um, in fact, both this person and myself just teared up a few seconds ago because I am thrilled to have a colleague and, and a mentor and someone I look, look up to, and there's not a lot of people I look up to, uh, with me today, uh, Dr. Georgia Ede. Um, and, you know, what I was telling Georgia a few minutes ago is that I've got a PhD on my shirt. We all have a bunch of degrees and qualifications, and she works at Harvard, which by itself is accolade, and the degrees and qualifications are nice and important. But but I focus on how I feel when I interact with someone, both written and verbally and in conversation. And, and Georgia is one of the most inspiring, compassionate, empathetic, and succinct people I have heard speak, and who connected me my presence at the Swiss Reconference was directly and exclusively because of her. And such an incredible mind in terms of seeing a problem and objectifying it. And that's what we're going to talk about today with her book that she's just published. She's able to see a problem and objectify it while having a wry sense of humor and humility about it. She she really is, from a humanistic perspective, what I call a door opener. Somebody that connects with people and you lean in and you want to spend time with her. Uh, someone that I felt instantly comfortable with looking up to and admiring for the talented manner in which she connects with people. And ultimately, that is so important because she is a psychiatrist. And I normally think of psychiatrists at people who, as people in the mental health space that write prescriptions. I see therapists that treat people. I see psychologists that test people and psychiatrists write prescriptions. And you are not that. You are deep thinking, compassionate, and your book is part of that. And hearing you on stage speak, that's what you do. And you've written this wonderful book called Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind. And we're going to dig deep into that and nerd out a little bit about that. So welcome. I, you know, I, I don't know what to say. That was just the, the nicest introduction everybody's ever given me. Thank you so much. And, and not a degree mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, um, let's dive into the deep end of this. Now, I, I'm going to Rod and poke some, some important questions here. Your first chapter um, speaks about mental health from a metabolic perspective. And I see mental health from a metabolic perspective, but there's also an organic component. To what extent is mental health, the global aspect of mental health and mental illness, organic, genetic versus metabolic are they separate are they linked how how do those concepts interact i mean how is it possible that schizophrenia can have a metabolic component to it yeah and so i mean we could spend an hour talking about what the definitions of all three of those words are you know and so i mean it's all connected right so so i mean metabolism represents i mean depending on who you ask just about everything every cell is doing all day long. <laughs> you know, so it's not just how it produces energy, how the cell produces energy, but how it takes care of itself, how it cleans up after itself, you know, all of everything, how it interacts with other cells. And so a metabolism, uh, you know, it's just it's just the daily business of 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 living and being a cell. And so of course, if metabolism is isn't running properly, the cell isn't working properly, the organ won't work properly. And uh so you know, depending on how you define metabolism, it could be, you can think of it as just about everything, or you can think about it more, um, sort of in a more focused way about, you know, how the cell breaks down fuel molecules and turns them into energy. And then, uh, and then what, and, and what else it decides to do with those molecules. Well, let, me, let me ask yeah. you, yeah, sorry to interrupt. I, 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 please, 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 a little bit. the way I look at the brain and as a surgeon with a little intrepidation and fear and lack of knowledge, but brain cell, every cell has to live, has to repair itself, but it also has a particular function. It has a job. It goes out to work. <laughs> brain has a unique job in terms of mentation and regulation of a variety of functions. I mean, the brain, the brain cells and the neural network are unique in terms of the job that they do. And the question, and I understand that every cell has to repair itself. Every cell has to, uh, well, not the brain cells so much divide, but they have the metabolic part. They need energy to function. But how does that metabolism specifically, beneficially and negatively affect the job that the brain cells have to do? Yeah, so so it so the brain is a um, a very high energy organ, 
So it uses about 10 times more energy than you would expect for an organ of its size because it's electrical. And uh, generating electricity uh, requires an awful lot of energy. So if you don't have a steady supply of high quality, reliable energy, uh, and really just at every second of every day, the brain is not gonna be able to work at its full capacity and something will go wrong. So it could be that, you know, it's not able, that certain cells aren't able to fire when they're supposed to, or it could be that certain cells are firing when they're not supposed to, uh, and, uh, and, or, or that certain, or they're, that they're not able to uh, repair and maintain themselves. So they break down and they don't work at all. So there are lots of, there are lots of different things that could go wrong. And I think this is exactly why to speak to, to come back to your previous question about how can a disorder like schizophrenia be rooted in metabolic issues, but also depression and also dementia and also bipolar disorder, ADHD. How can all of these seemingly very different diagnoses potentially be rooted at least in part in the same problem? And I think uh, that's really the, the, the mystery that, that I find so intriguing. And the way I think about it, and it's very simplistic, um, is, well, you know, that might be where the genetics come in. That might be where your life experience up to that point comes in, or your, even your epigenetics, you know, how your parents and grandparents lived their lives and what kinds of insults you've already suffered in your life. So, you know, they're always saying, well, people are always saying, oh, you know, this runs in your family, uh, dementia runs in your family, or depression runs in your family. You just have the genes for it, right? Um, but these genes... Our lifestyle and the way the way we eat, especially in how we how we live, decides which genes are going to be active and how active they're going to be. And so, I do think we have some control over their expression, but I don't think, for the most part, I don't think that our DNA is our destiny. I think that, you know, you could have a hundred people in a room with insulin resistance. Not all of those people are going to get type 2 diabetes. <laughs> some of them are going to get dementia. Some of them are going to get obesity. Some of them are going to get fatty liver. So, you know, so some of them are going to get cancer. And I look at that's the, where the, the, right. the luck of the draw comes in. Organic diseases. The, the brain, my viewpoint of the brain is it's just this mystical organ that can do so many crazy functions. And I use the word crazy colloquially. I, it, <laughs> it, it, you know, you're talking about a cell firing. And that's very sterile and an organic way of looking at the brain. What about our thoughts? What about our abstract uh, views? What about the ability of me to, to work with my hands or talk? This is a highly coordinated intracellular link that is occurring in the brain. And I, what I'm looking at more from a brain function, you're looking at this organically, it's a cellular, it's an electrical system, but the mystique of the brain and where I see the disruption going is not just single cells, but it's the coordinate coordination of various cells and pathways, white matter, gray matter. I mean, it's so intricate and so complex. And I understand we can get this down to a metabolic level, but as a psychiatrist taking off your organic hat, how does all of that interplay? How does, uh, a lot of these diseases are expressive diseases, disorders. Right. And and how do how do you take individual substrates and molecules and firing and create this wonderful thing, whether it's me appreciating those flowers behind you or being able to make a, do a mathematical sum or even just talk and use my hands. I mean, I think honestly, if I knew the answer to that question, I would win a Nobel prize. <laughs> <laughs> it is, a, I mean, the brain is beautifully mysterious and it's been frustrating, you know, for, for millennia, like trying to understand, you know, where do thoughts come from? Where's the soul housed? You know, how do we, what makes you, you and me, me, uh, when we're so genetically similar? Uh, it, you know, it, it's just, and how can we have this great diversity of, of human beings and uh, thoughts and experiences and feelings? I, I mean, I think that's the, that's one of the beauties of the, one of the mysteries of life. I mean, the brain, because we can't see it or feel it or touch it or see it working, you know, we, it, it's always been difficult for us to really understand it. Um, and, and I think it's still, there's still so much that we have to learn. But one of the things I think that's really exciting 
right now about the field of psychiatry. I mean, psychiatry has been, you know, after decades of standing still is really taking a quantum leap forward. And, and, and I don't think that's an exaggeration. I think finally we have, I mean, we've been working in the dark for, for so long, kind of guessing at, you know, well, I wonder what this, what, you know, what was, what, why this person is depressed. I wonder which medication might help this person. It's all been guesswork, you know, questionnaires and checking boxes and throwing spaghetti against the wall and seeing what sticks. And, and now we actually, when you start to appreciate that the brain is an organ like any other organ, unlike, but also is also an organ, it can malfunction if your, if your metabolic health isn't, isn't good. And of course, and so if we step back, we zoom out. I mean, we've been trying to zoom in for so long and understand, but I think actually if you zoom out and think, oh, the brain's part of the body. It's an organ like any other organ. It can malfunction like any other organ can malfunction. Maybe it's not a spiritual deficit. Maybe it's not a deep characterological flaw. Maybe as my one of my patients said to me today, maybe there isn't anything wrong with me. Maybe there's something wrong with my diet. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it i mean i just think it it is extraordinarily complex and humbling and at once just an organ like any other organ that needs the same care as every other organ does and i think that has been useful to me uh as much as i can remain in awe of the brain i also can think of it as okay it needs energy, it needs fuel, it needs nutrients, it needs to be protected against, you know, all the damage that our diet is doing to us, just like the rest of our cells do. So to what extent, I, I love that that narrative, to what extent is the DSM-5 and all these wonderful diagnoses, all those four-letter words that you were throwing out there, the ADHDs and that kind of thing, to what extent are those a magical, mystical cloak, as you said, of camouflaging something that we see observationally as a behavior. And what you've done is walk backwards, as you said, taking that bigger picture and said, look, forget about all that magical cloaking to explain something we can't explain. And let's look at the organic nature of the brain and see how what it needs to optimally function. And if we give the brain the adequate sub substrates in the right balance, I hate that word, but in, in the right ratios, um, feed the brain what it optimally needs, it's going to function normally and then we don't need to use these other words to explain metabolic maladaptation. Is that a reasonable assessment of where you're coming from in this book? I think it's a, a beautiful uh, summary of, of where I'm coming from in the book. Uh, and and it really is that, I mean, what other creature on earth needs to understand how its brain works in, in order for it to function? I mean, we don't need, I mean, I think it's fascinating. I love trying to understand the brain, but you don't, you shouldn't need to understand the brain in order for it to function well. It was designed, it evolved to function if you give it the right ingredients. And I think that the, it, it, it's mostly about that. Yes, there are other pieces to the puzzle, but why not start there with the most important piece, which is making sure the brain is, you, we nourish the brain with all essential nutrients, we protect the brain from damaging influences of these not these ultra processed non food ingredients which which promote inflammation and oxidative stress and insulin resistance and why not why not protect the brain's metabolism by protecting your metabolism by keeping your glucose and insulin levels in a healthy range if you do those three things and they're really very basic in a lot, I mean, it took me 400 pages to explain, you know, how it works, but, uh, but, you know, it's really, it's really that simple. Um, we, we really lost, I mean, nutrition science has lost its way, you know, really since the 1950s, we've been completely off course. And that's why it took almost 400 pages to get, to try to get people back on track. Well, isn't, isn't that in large part industry path. driven? Isn't that, that's not science driven, that's industry driven, whether it's the Folks trying to protect uh, tobacco by blaming fat, whether it's Coke trying to protect their product by saying we don't exercise enough, whether it's these pharma drugs, a myriad of psychiatric drugs. Most often we don't even know what they do, but we throw them at, sick, at patients with di DSM diagnoses and hope that they somehow magically work. So that's what we want to step away from. So you've really taken off your psychiatry hat and looked more at this from an organic chemistry hat, but you said something earlier on that the brain is like all other organs. 
But I'm going to disagree with you when we talk about nutrition because the brain is encased in something that prevents it more than any other organ from getting adequate substrate. And that's called the blood-brain barrier. And it's a defense mechanism, but it's also a barrier to a large number of things that we consider to be essential to other organs from readily crossing into the brain. Long chain proteins, long chain amino acids, long chain fatty acids, they don't quickly, they don't rapidly go across the blood brain barrier. So by defending itself with this moat, I think of it as a castle uh, where the king is in the castle and you've got this moat around it. The problem is you can't get food into the brain as well as you can any other organ. And there's this dichotomy. So as you look at what essential substrates the, need, the brain needs to adequately function and to repair itself. And as you said, it's a very big spender of, it's a bit like my wife on Amazon. There's continuously Amazon trucks coming to the house because she's, and I love her to bits, but she's, so if I build a big fence around my house, um, what would the Amazon guys do with their delivery? They'd have little boxes and squeeze them through the fence. But how does the brain then get the substrates that you believe it needs? What are the essential substrates? How does the rest of the body break them down for delivery to the brain in adequate amounts? We know long chain fatty acids just don't cross. And how do these substrates cross the brain? That's the part A of the question. The second question is, a lot of the regulatory functions of substrate, the big hormones are proteins, insulin, glucagon, and they don't easily cross into the brain. But we know that the brain has its own form of glucagon. It's got its own form of insulin. It's got its own hormones that we might not even have described yet. And it makes them inside of the brain. So the question is, how does the food that we eat get into the brain? What foods are essential in what format? And, you know, the liver, for example, takes amino acids, makes them into protein but they don't easily get into the brain. Same thing with fat. So how do you get them into the brain? How do you cross this barrier? And what do you believe are the essential substrates? And to what degree is there internal hormonal regulation within the brain that is exclusive? So many questions. Um, so let me so let me sort of step back and say, okay, how does the brain get the the substrate? How does it get the molecules that it needs? How does it get the vitamins, the minerals, the fatty acids, the amino acids, uh, and and the fuel molecules, largely glucose and and ketones? How how does it get those molecules? So is the brain so, is the brain sugar dependent? Uh, it is glu It does require some glucose at all times. Okay. But we don't have to eat that glucose because the liver makes it. Correct. You can get your glucose from outside your body from your diet or from inside your body from fat and protein. Um, but either way, the, the brain does require some glucose at all times, but uh, the majority of its fuel needs can be met by ketones, uh, but, but not 100% of its fuel needs. And that's because uh, there are certain functions in the brain that do require glucose or function at least optimally on glucose. So for example... Um, there are certain cells, the, glutam the, the, the glutamatergic cells, for example, which are, they make glutamate, which is the brain's primary excitatory neurotransmitter. They need fast energy. And one of the advantages glucose has over ketones is that glucose burns faster. So if you want, if you have a rapid fire cell, you may need uh, to function optimally. You may want to uh, burn a substrate that burns more quickly. And so you can chop up glucose much more quickly than you can uh, then, then you can, uh, then again, you can chop up ketones. The other thing is that um, there is a construction pathway in cells uh, called the pentose phosphate pathway uh, that's used to build certain molecules, include antioxidants and nucleic acids. Glucose uh, is the only molecule that can go through that pathway because ketones are too small. So we do need some glucose at all times, but the majority of our, the fuel needs of the brain can be met uh, by ketones uh, if, we, if, we, if we choose to live that way. Yeah, the only other comment there is that glucose, and I like that explanation of the pentose pathway, because for the most part, I look at glucose as an essential fuel, but it is not really adaptable into structure. Whereas ketones fulfill two separate roles. They have a fuel, an energy role, but the brain itself can turn ketones into ketones 
into longer fatty acids and can use them because they cross the blood brain barrier very easily and it can rebuild chains. It's like individual pearls going across and then the brain itself can build the, the pearl string or the pearl chain to be used as structural fat for the cell wall, for the organelles that are turning over. Uh, is that correct? Um, is that an appropriate summary that, the, that there's more flexibility, biologic flexibility with ketones that can be triaged toward fuel or structure as opposed to glucose? I think it depends on what you're trying to make and what the hormonal situation is, but the brain does have that flexibility. Uh, and, for, and so, for example, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the brain is full of cholesterol, lots and lots of cholesterol. But that's bad. Doesn't that kill the brain? <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, the, brain, the brain makes it on purpose because it's on a suicide mission. <laughs> <laughs> the brain make cholesterol, or is it uh, is it across the blood brain barrier? So this is one of the one of the when you said you know how does it get everything it needs and this blood brain barrier is an actual barrier in some cases. Cholesterol is the best example of that because when it comes to amino acids, there are special transport molecules that can you know usher uh, the amino acids across the blood brain barrier. They don't diffuse you know simply across. They they do need a carrier molecule. Um, glucose, glucose is, is, uh, also has a carrier molecule as does insulin, but cholesterol, cholesterol is too big and bulky to cross the blood brain barrier. And so, uh, even though the brain, uh, uh contains 20% of the body's cholesterol, again, 10 times more than you would expect for an organ of its size, rich in cholesterol, not a single molecule of that cholesterol comes from the food you eat, not a single molecule of it comes from your bloodstream. The brain makes every molecule of cholesterol that it needs on site from scratch. Do you know if it uses the HMG CoA reductase pathway? Of course it does. Yes. And that pathway is regulated by insulin in the in the liver. Is it also regulated by insulin in the brain? Do you know? I would assume so, although I haven't looked specifically at it, but I would assume so. So the other question then, just while just I and I, I meander, I I don't. Go, like, do, do, go, that's fine. <laughs> the question is: When people are on statins or cholesterol lowering medications. Uh, that interfere with HMG-CoA reductase in the liver, do they cross the blood-brain barrier and do they have a similar cholesterol-lowering effect in the brain? They absolutely do. In fact, yeah. Wait, 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 stop, 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 yes. stop. Can you repeat that again? This is, <laughs> I, 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 I will do that from time to time when there's something Please, anytime. in my brain and say that again. So all statin medications uh, cross the blood brain barrier, some much more easily than others, uh, Lipitor and Zocor, um, and others uh, with much more difficulty because they're not as fat soluble, but they all do to a certain extent. So when the statins cross the blood brain barrier, they do the very same thing in the brain that they do in the rest of the body, which is they turn down the activity of HMG CoA reductase, which is the enzyme that, that allows the brain to make the vital cholesterol molecules that it needs to function. Well, right, they're not vital because surely God in nature made the brain make cholesterol as a kill switch. Because <laughs> that's what all the statin people are telling us, aren't they? Is that is this cholesterol so bad for you? And somewhere along the line, God or nature, whichever pathway you follow, said, hey, you've lived long enough. We're going to put a kill switch in here and create Alzheimer's and a kill switch in your liver to kill you. Or maybe maybe cholesterol is biologically necessary for those organs. You know, I wondered that myself because you look at every membrane in the body, it seems to have cholesterol in it. So, um, you know, I, I just, I, it, it seems to me to be uh, um, rather dangerous that we're constructed this way. I mean, just, it just boggles my mind. That, <laughs> and I bet you that nobody or extremely few people that prescribe statin routinely for cardiovascular risk even consider or know what you just said and yet that is so profound that 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 pathway is necessary and we know that the brain is about five percent of the body weight and contains about 20 percent of the body's cholesterol that's a number that that i that i've heard is that do you think that's correct it's to, uh, the number that i have seen so often is two percent versus twenty percent okay two two versus twenty my brain's bigger than yours then i'm five percent <laughs> <laughs> Touche. No, but, but, two, two, but it's still 20%. Of, that's, that ratio is even bigger. The two yes, to exactly. 20. Exactly. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And and statins block that. So what is that? What, what is, what is the, the role of cholesterol then? And what happens when you reduce cholesterol production in the brain? 
Well, you know, the, it's a very well-documented side effect and also clinically, um, I, I've observed it many times in patients, uh, brain fog and memory problems. Cognitive impairment from statins is not uncommon. And, and I know this not only because there have been cases reported, but also because I've worked with you know, patients for so many years now who take, because I'm like, my gosh, so many people take a statin medication now. And uh, so I've worked with lots and lots of patients who have started statins, their memory, you know, seems to seems to become impaired or they become foggier, is in trouble word finding, things like that. They stop the statin, their brain clears up. They go back on a different statin because eventually someone convinces them that they should. Lo and behold, the, the, the brain fog comes back. Now, this doesn't happen to everybody, but it's happened enough times for me to be uh, to be convinced that this is not uh, not a fluke, and you know it's interesting I, to corroborate that. I've got a I think you know this person. He's a good good friend and colleague of ours, uh, Stephen Cunane, who works oh, in yeah. the time of space. And Stephen quotes often a study of I think it was American soldiers, vet, veterans, that were on statins and they had a cognitive impairment study done, uh, a, a test, a quiz uh, on statins. They then took them off statins, I believe, for eight weeks and their cognitive impairment improved significantly, they then put them back on the statins and they saw the same deterioration over time. Uh, so that was, the, that again corroborated that, that concept, but I didn't realize that um, the pathways, uh, you've just elaborated on that, and that's, that's raised my knowledge level. The question then uh, along those lines is over time, does that cognitive impairment, because it, Stevens demonstrated early cognitive impairment is reversible, but is that does that eventually become permanent? Is there enough of an injury to permanently lose uh, or, or have that cognitive impairment? I don't know. I mean, I think it would depend on the degree and the and the duration of the impairment. Because if you think about what all that cholesterol is doing up there in the brain, so you know, cholesterol is a, is an essential component of every of every membrane of every cell in the whole body. So not just every brain cell. Um, and, and the brain is rich in cholesterol, so rich in cholesterol, ultra rich in cholesterol, because it's richer in membranes than most other organs in the body. Uh, not just, not just uh, when you think about myelin. So, you know, myelin is the, the insulating, the, 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 the insulating material that, that, uh, that rat, that winds around all of our circuits, our brains are circuits so, and, and networks so that electricity can be, can be conducted efficiently and rapidly. So what myelin is, is it's just a huge, you know, very thick coil of very tightly wound membranes. That's a lot of cholesterol concentrated, uh, in, in that insulating material. So just imagine if you didn't have enough cholesterol. I mean, cholesterol does a variety of things in the brain. Uh, not only is it wound up in all that myelin, but also it's this, it's a vital component of something called a lipid raft, which is a, a stiffened area of nerve of brain cell of brain cells where communication takes place and where cell migrate and that allows cell migration to take place. So it kind of guides nerve endings to their destinations and the when brain cells are developing. So m lots and lots of important uh, functions. So just imagine if you didn't have enough of those. And what is the what is the um, consumed substrate, uh, you say the brain produces cholesterol. What you say, what does the brain make cholesterol out of? Well, well, just about every cell in the body can make cholesterol and it can really make it out of anything because it's just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So you can make it out of glucose, you can make it out of fat. Um, and uh, so uh, it, it really doesn't, you can use whatever substrate you have handy. And I don't, I haven't looked specifically to see what the brain's favorite substrate is to to make cholesterol well, see, my understanding is that it's ketones and that the oh. brain is much more adept to use ketones toward cholesterol and the glucose pathway is again I, i'm speaking under correction so this needs to be researched and corroborated